from stories around the world to stories here at home. This is the National News Broadcast. A pleasant evening. I'm Dilan Juliananda. A very good evening. I am Dishan Virakorn and we start off by taking a look at your headlines for tonight. The Colombo Stock Exchange records its highest value in its history. A significant growth is shown in the industrial sector in the third quarter of 2020. The patient who spat on health officials at Atalugama sentenced for six years of rigorous imprisonment. The President and the Prime Minister extend greetings to the new US President. The airports are opened for tourists. Praja Jala Abhimane program provides safe drinking water to areas with a severe water shortage. The government's vision on cane industry presented to the people. 13 die in a suicide bomb attack in Iraq. Now in a top story for tonight, President Joe Biden has signed 10 executive orders to boost the fight against COVID-19, which has ravaged the US while covering climate, equality and immigration. Now the move comes within 24 hours after Democratic presidential winner Joe Biden was sworn in as the 46th president of the United States of America. Democracy has prevailed, he said, after taking the oath of office from Chief Justice John Roberts. Donald Trump, who has not formally conceded the presidency to President Biden, snubbed the inauguration ceremony in a departure from long-standing precedent. The inauguration took place at the U.S. Capitol and there were extra tight security after the building was stormed by violent protesters in a deadly riot on January the 6th. Close to 25,000 National Guards protected the ceremony, which missed the traditional hundreds of thousands of spectators due to the coronavirus pandemic. Among those attending the ceremony were three of his predecessors, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, as well as former President Trump's Vice President Mike Pence. The inauguration ceremony included musical performances by Lady Gaga, who sang the national anthem, as well as Jennifer Lopez and Garth Brooks. Kamala Harris was sworn in as Vice President ahead of President Biden. She is the first woman and the first black and Asian American person to serve in the role, a heartbeat from the presidency. In his inaugural address, President Biden said it was a day of history and hope. The incumbent president added that his whole soul will devote in putting America back together again. In his inaugural address, he outlined the biggest challenges facing his presidency, a devastating pandemic, massive job losses, a threatened environment, and urgent calls for racial justice and a resurgence of political extremism. Newly sworn in U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and her husband Doug Emhoff escorted former Vice President Mike Pence and his wife Karen to their car as they departed the U.S. Capitol following the inauguration ceremony. Harris and Emhoff chatted briefly with the Pences and waved as the car left to take them to Joint Base Andrews in Maryland. The Pences attended the inauguration of new President Joe Biden after skipping both a farewell ceremony for Donald Trump and the usual protocol of welcoming his successor to his home at the Naval Observatory. U.S. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris ended their first night in office by enjoying a program featuring performances by Lady Gaga and John Legend and hosted by Tom Hanks. The evening culminated with a fireworks show that Biden and his family watched from the White House balcony. Former President Trump was the first president not to attend his successor's inauguration since 1869. He left the White House early on Wednesday and flew to the nearby Andrews Air Force Base. Following his arrival in Florida, the former president insisted that they will be back in some form while addressing the masses gathered to welcome him. On his first day in office, President Joe Biden signed more than a dozen executive actions, some of which reversed decisions made by his predecessor, former President Donald Trump. Several executive actions will make changes to the U.S. response to COVID-19 and try to ease some of the financial strain on Americans resulted from the pandemic. Other executive actions directly target and undo President Trump's actions on the environment, immigration, the U.S. census and regulatory changes. President Biden signed three executive orders in the presence of reporters implementing a mass mandate on federal property, increasing support for underserved communities and rejoining the Paris Climate Accord.
Meanwhile, President Gotabe Rajapaksha congratulated the new U.S. President Biden on his assumption of office as the 46th President of USA today. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha also conveyed his best wishes to the new President of the United States of America. President Gotabe Rajapaksa, in a tweet, congratulated the new U.S. president and emphasized that the Sri Lankan government is looking forward to working together towards a stronger and mutually beneficial bilateral relationship. President Gotabe Rajapaksa also greeted Vice President Kamala Harris, saying he looks forward to working together towards a strengthened bilateral relationship. In a tweet, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa also mentioned that he is looking forward to working with new U.S. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris to further strengthen the relationship between both countries. Opposition leader Sajid Premadasa also congratulated both U.S. President Biden and Vice President Harris and conveyed his best wishes on behalf of all Sri Lankans. Now, the all share price index of the Colombo Stock Exchange reported its highest value today in its 35 year old history. Now, the share market today renewed its record kept on Monday. The all share price index of the Columbus Stock Exchange crosses 8,000 points for the first time in 35 years, closing the trading at 8,131.25. The S&P Sri Lanka 20 index also shows an upward trend, gaining 100 points to close at 3,196.73. The turnover crosses 14 billion rupees, marking the highest figure over a year, with 67,831 trades changing hands. The total market capitalization is 3,554 billion rupees. This is Imesha Fernando from the Columbus Stock Exchange. Now, the Department of Population and Statistics says that local industrial sector has achieved a significant growth in the third quarter of last year when compared with the third quarter of 2019. This has been stated in the national account estimate issued for third quarter 2020 by the Department of Population and Statistics. The statistics has confirmed that the country has been on the correct economic path amid the coronavirus pandemic. It has said that the growth has been achieved due to the steps taken to normalize civilian lives by following all health protective measures under the guidance of the President and the Prime Minister, limiting of imports and providing refinancing facilities, capital co-business are main among them. South Bagheer, COVID-19 revival concessionary loan scheme implemented with the aim of uplifting small and medium-scale entrepreneurs affected by the pandemic has contributed to the growth of the industrial sector. Nearly 180 billion rupees of loans have been given under the loan scheme for 63,000 such business enterprises. The manufacturing sector has been able to achieve a growth of 5.3% in the third quarter of 2020 when compared with the third quarter of 2019. The Department of Population and Statistics points out that industrial activities during that quarter have shown 0.6% of growth rate. It has taken place as a result of recommencing activities in manufacturing sector after we opening the country following the first COVID wave. Chemical products and primary medicine production have achieved more growth during the period, which is 13.1%. Food and tobacco productions, which contribute 6.9% to gross domestic product, of, have been a growth of 11.5%. The report says that rubber and plastic products have increased by 4.8%. 8% and other commercial products by 4.2%. The department says that construction and mining sectors have shown a setback due to the pandemic. Now the Humanities and Social Sciences Faculty of the Colombo University celebrated its centenary year today. A series of programs has been organized in connection with the anniversary. 
The Columbia University was launched on 21st of January 1921 as the Ceylon University College. The university, which commenced with 115 students, was affiliated to the London University. Sri Lanka's first university was launched in 1942 with the Colombo Medical College. The first building was the College House. A centenary celebration has been organized in front of the College House under the patronage of present Vice Chancellor of the Columbia University, Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna. New Education Center of the Faculty with Modern Technology was opened today. The new auditorium and the e museum established at the, at the computer school located in the building with six floors were vested with the students. Meanwhile, another ceremony was held to mark the centenary year of the Library of the Colombo University. President Gotabe Rajapaksha extended greetings in connection with the centenary year of the Humanities and Social Sciences Faculty of the Colombo University. Addressing the gathering through video technology, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha commended the progress achieved by the Colombo University. Minister Professor G.L. Pires Minister Professor G. L. Pires, Chairman of the University Grants Commission, Professor Sampat Amartunga, and a group of people were present on this occasion. Now, in more stories here at home, the Ministry of Tourism says that all airlines which conducted passenger operations in Sri Lanka before the COVID pandemic have agreed to recommence flight operations. Minister Prasanna Ranatunga mentioned this today during a function to brief the reopening of the airports for tourists. Katunayaka and Mattala airports, which were temporarily closed due to COVID pandemic, were reopened for tourists today. The first flight from Muscat touched down at Katunayaka International Airport at 7.30 a.m. today with 50 passengers on board. It included 46 Sri Lankans and four foreign nationals. The Ministry of Tourism says that many flights will arrive at Katunayaka and Mattala airports from tomorrow with tourists and Sri Lankans. The airports were temporarily closed on 17th of March last year with the spread of the first COVID wave. The government has taken steps to reopen the airports for tourists after 10 months while taking strict health protective measures with the aim of preventing the spread of COVID-19 to the society from tourists and vice versa. Minister Prasanna Ranatunga said in Colombo today that the government hopes to make the tourism industry its main income avenue. Updates, 
information, downloads on the safety protocols and processes, the marketing material, insurance details and important contact information. All visitors and our industry stakeholders are requested to frequently visit the site and to be aware of all the updates and requirements as these processes and protocols will evolve depending on the changing changes taking place locally and globally. We have also set up a 24-hour operational center to coordinate the operations and to support the industry, clarifications and situational management support. The center can be contacted through the hotline 1912 and email through hello again at Sri Lanka Travel. We have also delivered a series of webinars, hands-on practical training, had discussion sessions targeting the tourism industry in preparation for the tourism in the new normal, ensuring that the high service quality and best experience for the travelers. Our tourism industry is equipped. We are coordinated. We are ready to welcome you and to give the world the warmth of the Sri Lankan hospitality while ensuring safety and health. However, I must say that no system or process is perfect, but we ensure that we are on it with our entire team, may it be the Ministry of Health, the COVID Task Force, the Civil Aviation Authority, the Airport Aviation Authority, the Department of Immigration and Immigration, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and our entire industry, including the travel agents, to operators, hotels, accommodation providers, tour guides, tourist drivers, all the airlines, including the national carrier, Sri Lankan Airlines. We are united front and we are on it to ensure our travelers have the best possible experience in Sri Lanka. We momently leave it from local news to bring you the global update of the COVID pandemic. The latest COVID-19 wave has hit the hospital northwest of London with even more force than the first wave as younger patients fill its wards and fewer of the sickest people respond to treatment. Doctors and nurses in the United Kingdom are grappling with the strain of exhaustion and loss. It's tough. It's tough. It's draining. It's draining physically. It's draining mentally the decisions that we're having to make on people, the decisions that we're having to make on people that ordinarily would survive are not surviving the coronavirus. At Milton Keynes University Hospital, northwest of London, it's a battle between life and death. The latest COVID-19 wave tearing through the UK hit the hospital with even more force than the first, as younger patients fill its wards and fewer of the sickest people respond to treatment. 68-year-old Stephen Marshall initially tested negative for COVID-19 following a recent operation on his back. He thought he just had a cold. Now he's on oxygen. I couldn't get up the stairs without puffing and panting. Couldn't get to the kitchen without puffing and panting. Didn't want to eat. Didn't want to drink. So after a week, I just called up the ambulance. And here I am, sighted. Staff like Joy Halliday, a consultant in intensive care and acute medicine, are grappling with the strain of exhaustion and loss. She's caring for 51-year-old supermarket worker, Victorita. She was put on oxygen immediately. So we're getting a lot more people coming into hospital, a lot younger and a lot fitter. They're getting steroids and remdesivir, but even despite that, Victorita, who's young and fit and 51, still ended up needing to go on to a non-invasive ventilator. The youngest person being ventilated in the hospital is only 28. Education Minister Gavin Williamson offered some hope on Thursday, saying the national lockdown is having some impact in reducing pressure on the National Health Service, despite a grim record number of deaths Wednesday. But for frontline workers like the clinical director Wasim Shamsuddin, the battle is far from over. Intensive care hospitals are meant to be a place where we treat patients and make them better. And, you know, I think the, the difficulty is here is that even though we try our best and we, we you know, throw everything at, at the patients, including the kitchen sink, it just doesn't seem to be working. And so... Um, I think, you know, yes it, does get, yes, it does get to us. Yes, I think long-term um, staff will have to come to terms with this pandemic and I think um, certainly we'll probably see staff leaving the NHS because of what they've experienced. Now bringing you the local update of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
The number of COVID-19 recoveries in the country has increased up to 47,987. Accordingly, the percentage of fully recovered COVID-19 patients in the country is at 86.42. Thirteen point zero nine percent COVID nineteen patients is under treatment, which includes seven thousand two hundred and sixty eight. A total of twelve thousand five hundred fifty five COVID nineteen recoveries have been reported in the country since the beginning of this month. Another seven hundred and sixty nine COVID nineteen recoveries were reported in the country today. Eighteen thousand seventy two PCR tests were conducted yesterday. Accordingly, the total number of PCR tests up to now has reached one million five hundred forty seven thousand six hundred fifty five. Meanwhile, one COVID nineteen related death was reported yesterday. The deceased woman has been identified as a resident from Mallavagedra, aged fifty three. Cricketers Binra Fernando and Chamika Karuna Ratna have been infected with COVID-19. They have been identified to be infected with the disease following PCR tests conducted during training for the West Indies tour. The other players who trained with them are scheduled to be sent for PCR tests. 22 immigrant workers who go back to employment in South Korea left the country this morning. It is the first group that left for South Korea this year. They will be sent for places of employment after undergoing 14 days of quarantine in South Korea. A discussion took place today with the participation of Army Commander General Shavendra Silva, Director General of Health Services Dr. Asil Gunavardhan and the higher management representatives of private sector laboratories. They were instructed to implement health recommendations to the maximum level. Head of the National Operations Center to prevent the spread of COVID-19, Army Commander General Shavendra Silva said that several areas were removed from isolated status from this afternoon. It includes eight Gramanilidari divisions of Katankudi Police Area, isolated status of 660A Epitimulla and 659B Bamunumulla Gramanilidari divisions of Atalugama area in Bandaragama has been lifted. Isolation of Munaragala, Badalkumbura, Alupota Gramaniladar Division has also been removed. Meanwhile, Arasadi Gramaniladar Division of the Batiklo District has been isolated. Meanwhile, Head of the Presidential Task Force on Economic Revival and Poverty Eradication, Basil Rajapaksha, says that the Department of National Community Water Supplies is entrusted with a major task when meeting drinking water requirement of the rural communities. The Samata Jalia project is scheduled to be implemented according to the budget to provide drinking water to rural people. Mr. Basil Rajapaksha mentioned this during a program yesterday to brief the officials of National Community Water Supplies Department. 3,100 million rupees has been allocated by the budget to provide water to communities. Drinking water is provided through drinking water supplies, water boards and community water projects. Mr. Basil Rajapaksha instructed officials to provide water to the rural communities through Prajajal Abhimane program, which is implemented as a five-year program. 150 billion rupees has been esti estimated for the project. Communities provide 20% value of the project constructions and community-based organizations conduct maintenance and operations. Improving water projects, preventing kidney disease, Praja Harita Abhimani program, management of rainwater and preparation of plants to save water are being implemented from this year to coincide with the Gama Samaga Pilisandrak Vada Samaga Yali Gamata program. Now, water purification machines are being provided in the areas where there is kidney disease. Steps have been taken to conserve water sources and to implement tree planting programs on the selected day annually through the Community Green Program. State Minister Sanat Nishanta and officials of the National Community Water Supplies Department attended the meeting. Leader of United National Party, Rani Rikamasinghe, says that all should took work together irrespective of political differences to eliminate the coronavirus pandemic. He mentioned this during a function today at party headquarters, Sirikota. The ceremony has been organized in connection with assuming duties by the new officials of the United National Party. The ceremony has been organized giving priority for religious observances and only a limited number of people attended the function. 
Leader of United National Party, Ranil Rikama Singh, has said that officials are entrusted with the responsibility of raising a voice outside parliament. He said that the main problem in the country is health security. He added that everyone should be gathered for health security respective of party differences. Now, the government's vision on the cane industry was vested with the people today. The ceremony has been organized by the state ministry rather, of cane, copper, clay, wood products and the rural industry promotions. Now, according to the Vistas of Prosperity program, Vedakarana Rate Alut Aswanna Jayave national ceremony held today, marking a resurgence of the cane industry. The ceremony took place at the Vanatha Villua area. A research on cane industry was presented at the ceremony. The program includes planting of cane saplings and allocation zones to conserve cane. Equipment was handled over as well in the ceremony. The National Craft Council issued a special identity card today for those who are engaged in the cane industry. The 74th anniversary of the Sinhala Cinema with Dialogues falls today. The 49th anniversary of the National Film Corporation also falls today. After showing of silent movies, first Sinhala film with Dialogues was screened on 21st January 1947. <laughs> Kadavana Porondua is recognized as the first film of the Sri Lankan cinema industry. Veteran actress Rukmini Devi entered into Singhala cinema by acting in the Kadavana Porondua. Director of the movie was Bengali national Jyot Singh and producer was S.M. Nayagam. Although the history of Singhala cinema is of Indian origin, at present Singhala cinema has contested even with international cinemas and has created its own identity. Parallel to the 74th anniversary of the Singhala Cinema and 49th year anniversary of National Film Corporation, Titus Totavatha Recording Studio was opened at Sarasave Film Studio premises along with a modernized editing unit. Chairman of the National Film Corporation, Jayant Dharmadasa, veteran actor Ravindra Randenia and veteran actress of Singhala Cinema, Malani Fonseca, were present on this occasion. In the meantime, the police special task force has found more than 20.5 million rupees, a 9mm pistol and a motorcycle with 1,200cc engine capacity and arrested a suspect after raiding a house at Vanvasala in Kalania. The raid has been conducted on information given by the military intelligence unit. Police media spokesman DIG Ajit Rohan has said that the 38-year-old suspect was arrested on suspicions of drug records. The special task force says that two fake number plates have been fixed on the motorcycle. Two magazines were found with the 9mm pistol manufactured in a foreign country. The Colombo Crimes Division is investigating the way the suspect has obtained the motorcycle, a pistol and money. Now, a suspect with heroin was taken into custody at Kolonawa Lux on the Seven Housing Scheme, according to an information received by the Western Province Anti Vice Court. It has been found that a person named Ananda Kumara is an accomplice of organized criminal gang leader Angoda Lokka. Police Special Task Force has arrested an accomplice of deceased criminal Ratmalane Rohan along with heroin and a forged passport. He has been arrested during a search conducted at Swaizapura area in Moratua. On sports, Sri Lanka cricket has called for a report on the alleged indisciplined behaviour between a player and a health official attached to the team. Several media reports have been published about the alleged incident. Sri Lanka cricket team manager Asanta Demel has been instructed by Sri Lanka Cricket to provide them with a report about the incident. Sri Lanka Cricket has said that if a disciplinary inquiry against the relevant parties is needed, it will be conducted. It has also said that if they were unable to deny their involvement, strict disciplinary action will be taken. And now that's a wrap of tonight's primetime news and until we meet again next time, do take care and good night. Good night.